Greetings everyone and welcome back to TNO, the last days of Europe in which we're playing, of course, as the Empire of Japan, but really, as someone put it in the comments section from yesterday, we're not really playing as the Empire of Japan, we're playing more of a detective game, kind of a crime novel, but before we begin with reading more events, I will say that if I need to, I'm just going to take a break in the middle of the episode if needed, but my goal is to get to as far into 63, maybe hopefully to 64 by the end of this video, but you never know, so we're going to go up. Tachi and Kodaira looked at each other grimly before they entered the office of their boss. They had worked hard to ensure that they had the proper allies and contacts to make this operation a reality, spending days finding the best men for the job, but they had to admit the idea was still rather risky. As soon as they explained the plan raid, their boss immediately began tearing into it. He was extremely skeptical that it could work at all, and worried about how terrible the repercussions could be if it failed. He was a man who played by the rules, and the rules were not terribly well defined here. The discussion was on the brink of becoming a full-blown argument, but... Through deft teamwork and excellent planning, Kodera and Tachi were able to hold their ground without pushing too hard. They explained every aspect of their plan and how it would be executed, and any concern their bias might have was quickly erased. Or eased. It was not short or easy, but after a long session, their boss was finally convinced the raid would happen. There was one catch, though. The boss was not convinced that the team had all the people needed to properly carry out the raid with the needed precision and ambition. He ordered the two detectives to gather more allies, people with real power and experience. He suggested less savory organizations that felt cheated by the competition from the government, or politicians who could use their clout to support the investigators and hurt their rivals. If Tachi and Kodaira could get the necessary help, then the raid would happen. Allies and politics are safer bet. Sometimes you need a criminal to catch criminal. If we use criminals, that could look really bad on the police department. I don't mind doing allies and politics or safer bets, because that's a little bit more clean. Obviously, this is not really clean, but we're going to be try to be as clean as possible. Hopefully. Let's see. Mine, eh, still not bad. We have a minus deficit, so hey, not bad. I'll, I'll gladly take that for now. Because things, according to someone, we should really watch out for what could happen on November 20th, 1963, but cabinet contacts. Tachi quickly went to work on getting in contact with politicians who might be willing to help the two detectives and the investigative team. He did some quick research and asking around, finding the proper rivalries and ties that could be exploited to make them more sympathetic. He had a rather large file on subjects, and rifling through it, he already was finding some very promising leads. He picked up the phone and started making some calls as soon as the right... He had the right info gathered. The talks were somewhat covert, with every word having to take on a double meaning so neither side could be incriminated, but after a while, Tachi was making progress. One particular minister had been feuding well with a high-ranking admiral for a few months, and was looking for any chance to shame him. The admiral just so happened to be closely involved with the case, and so it was essentially a done deal as soon as his name was brought up. Tachi gathered several other variously ranked politicians before calling it a night. The web of intrigue grows ever larger. Ooh, drop things, don't mind if we do. Cool. So we got that, we got this, better drop tanks, we'll be okay. Helicopter stuff, it's only 63, so we got a while to wait. Ooh, what do we want? Aerial refueling, that's a while as well. Air supremacy would be pretty good to do. Land doctrine, let's go through the land doctrine as quickly as possible first. How about that? And in the first quarter report, we actually got another focus done. And we got eight more civilian factories. How about we get the glory of the sphere? We have finally done it. Japan has dredged up the poor, faltering nations under the boot of the West, and lifted them up through economic growth and great prosperity. Standards of living are at all-time high, and technology continues to push forward without relenting. While the two other thirds of the world are crawling in the mud and suffering, Japan has created an economic system to last the ages and bring bounty. Tendo Haika Banzai, Dainihon Taikoku Banzai, Daitokyoken Banzai. Obviously, I don't speak Japanese, so... Yeah. Glory to the Emperor, I suppose. I don't know. Ooh. Civilian factories? Don't mind if we do. 100%, 100%, 100%. Nice. Uh, I still want to build as many factories for now, because once, once something happens here, we're probably not going to have that many factories to work with. So, going with six full lines and then some for infrastructure, I think that's a pretty good strategy for us. So, to catch a thief. The investigation team has gathered a cabal of uneasy friends and allies. The planning is in its final stages. The planners determined that a fast and clean raid is both possible and extremely desirable. A single drop of blood shed by either side could spell the catastrophe, but the last thing anyone wants is conflict among loyal servants of the Empire. Thus, this operation must be planned down to the millisecond. Every step and it mapped out, every factor brought into the question or equation. There remains, however, one titanic decision, to raid the army or to raid the navy. It seems that for this particular unsavory endeavor, the two have to put aside their differences and for mutual gain, but their general separation and traditional rivalry means that only one can be focused on. The team is divided on who plays a larger role and who is the right for target, but eventually a decision must be made army navy oh no so we get unpopular and we're weak that's not good well actually that is good for us Ooh, ija support paranoia will increase it's barely there so oh what do we want oh 
They have more information. Target the Navy. More information is probably better. But we do have a slightly more support from the army already. <sighs> well, we're weak. We're unpopular. We're going to strike the army. I want more information. I'm sorry, army. Let's see. 0.85 a day. We're still losing. Actually, how much stability are we losing now? We do have a cup of coffee here to keep us nice and warm, though. And energized with caffeine and drugs. Minus 3.8. Not bad. The Army HQ. In the end, it came down to a simple choice. Follow the boats or the guns a ship. The Army had a long and storied history of defying orders all the way up to the Emperor himself and an equally storied history of denying it to ever cross the line. To top it off, the equipment and volumes per shipment that the team estimated were necessary for the warehouse to be emptied in a shipping run were phenomenally large. Stupidly large. The entity running the series of shipments was totally unconcerned with its with its appearances, or so it seemed. Cordero emphasized the fact that it would be easy to track the physical shipments, far more so than the tracing the elaborate dance of, that, of the numbers that was the Navy financial scheme. <clears throat> Guns and equipment could be handled. They could be tracked and they could be traced. All that had to be, to be done was a drop of a sample into a black pool of the market. A trace bug here or there, and the army would drop piece by piece into the laps. Tachi was more than a little uncomfortable at becoming a gunrunner. He'd seen what happened to smugglers in his early days during the war, but if it was for the good of Japan, nothing could be withheld, he agreed. Meetings were scheduled, weapons were bugged, members were briefed, the team began to move. Let us begin proceedings. That's getting interesting. Not much, but hey, getting better. Getting better. Man, if we could get, like, our debt below our GDP right now, I would be so happy, but we can't do that, but we're tracking the guns. The contacts were more than a little mystified. They never heard such a singular, singularly ridiculous request. Buying a large truck of weaponry on short notice was nothing unusual for the police. Have a little unsettled for the usual operations, but to resell it on the same market? At a 50% revenue cut, it seemed like the Tokyo Metropolitan Police were out to burn away their annual budget. One contact even went so far as to advise Kodera over a drink to calm down and think about their finances before committing. It took a series of further drinks and a casual palming of financial greed to sewage his fears. The team worked overtime behind the scenes to get the modifications to the guns working out. Augmented sights, new chambers, new magazines, all with a flashy new additions. Who'd noticed that slightly heavier weights or the slightly hollow sound they made as they reloaded? Hopefully the army would be too deep in its cups to notice, and it wasn't more like more than a fraction of them did more than basic weapon cleaning, and the stories were to be believed. Slowly the scheme began to come together. The policemen donned anonymous black suits, prepared their assets, and waited for the biggest fish to snatch the bait. Based on prior activity, they wouldn't be waiting very long. Guns and butter for greasy palms. Oh boy. Can't wait to see what happens. Is there war support going down as well? It is not, it looks like, which is good. Balaga has defeated Kostromo. 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 Cool. And we're still training our ships, but hopefully they're going to be done soon, because the experience is not bad. And pull rank. Kodera had made it a point to maintain contact with the various... Oh, there goes Madagascar. Various assets in the armed forces in his long career. The madness of the imperial bureaucracy was easier to handle than when a few friends were there to provide strategic cover and ample elbow grease to get things done. These were the assets they had called upon to assist him, along with others in the army who felt ambitious enough to hitch their wagon to the investigation. And now he had another task for them. Calling them together in a bar where the secrets piled as high as the cigar smoke, he briefed them on what the next step would be. Interference was a familiar term to most of them, but this interference would be on an unprecedented scale, and all of it would center on a large shipment of weaponry the police were now shipping to the army. Internal security, counter surveillance, and protective measures, what was left of these protocols would vanish like morning dew, and then the mid-level operatives surrounding Kodera would be the cause. It was a simple job, and it could be done with bags of cash to the appropriate agencies as goodwill gifts, but men on the ground were far more reliable. After all, the army's inner branch rivalry and her sprawling organizational mess already resembled a minor civil war. All it would take was a little more interference here and there for caution to break down. Any and competition was a mother of desperation, and therefore a necessity. The Georgian horsemen will aid us greatly. Cool. And also, there's another comment from saying everything. From yesterday's comment section. Uh, keep reading everything, or don't stop reading. So, we're going to do that. Bug everything, though. The team swore obscenities under their breath. Another gosh darn storehouse, the fifth, in three days? They never get to sleep at this rate. But it was a problem born of their own success, with the agencies preparing to buy the weaponry exchange or arranging for meetings in secluded locations. Kodera and Tachi had ordered a zero slip policy regarding information transmitted by the army parties. Zero information could be lost by the police. This meant comprehensive surveillance of meeting locations, preparations of equipment, and obsessive arrangements of schedules to fit the timings just right. The team struggled to keep itself together in the face of increasing demands for surveillance in this fashion. One nearly snapped after hearing a series of wiretaps live instantly or instead, to the neighboring hotel room and its indiscretions. But room by room, bug by bug, the sheer scale of the task began to shrink in to organized streams of information, and the team had increasingly settled down to its new task, listening and watching. Now the storehouse doors had opened, and 17 separate cameras and audio bugs chittered with activity. It was time to commence a recording. The police were watching, after all, and soon all of Japan would be watching, too. We're always watching. Big Brother, help us out, Big Brother, help us out. Collapse of German Madagascar, the everlasting legacy of the Reich, falls apart. Not bad. Not bad, so yeah. I'm the, I don't want to do anything else here, because Eno is looking terrible. He is literally the 
weakest support anywhere. Oh, Paranoia is only 0.75, not bad. So, and the money will follow. The offers came in flowing one by one and meeting through letters in anonymous and not-so-anonymous offers in bars and hallways. Most of these offers would be considered. A few would be taken into special consideration, but only one would be accepted. It was how the business worked, after all. And behind the closed doors of surveillance rooms and the meeting rooms, a web grew to encompass army ministries, both small and large, logistics, intelligence, and literally half the infantry units in the sphere of the Air Force. Most of these agencies had attempted to use counter-espionage to collect their activities as per protocol, but the Trojan assets, as Tachi had taken to calling them, had neutered the efforts. The doors, for all intents and purposes, were wide open and everything and everyone could be seen. Some links on the web and the cluttered boards were thicker than most, but by far the largest individual connections were linked to an agency whose identity continued to elude the team until one offer. Written in hastily scribbled handwriting came up with an exact match of four font and writing style. A senior officer in the Ken Pai Tai, their biggest internal security competitor. Koder and Tachu looked at each other, and laughter echoed down the halls. After all the efforts taken to secure the target, it appeared that the end of the investigation would be an internal affair. A very internal affair. You have got to be kidding me. No, not really. I'm not going to kid you at all. Yay, more infrastructure. Yay, more factories. Yay. Build, build, build. Because we got to build, 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 build before things get really bad. And this will be done on April 5th. That's not bad. Note the bankers, Tachi and Kodera, continue to pour over all the documents. They have the major points now, but it's time to start taking down all the names, not just the big ones. They needed to make sure that nobody would escape once the music played. The focus would obviously be on the generals, the politicians, the big scandalous names, but one group that really needed to be brought down... A notch was the bankers. A few major names in the Japanese financial sector were showing up a lot more than they should. A quick bit of digging and cross-referencing showed their whole role in the scheme, routing and distributing the money through, the, through enough accounts and intermediaries so that it would not be noticed. They would guide the money down a complex path, dodging and darting through the trickling brooks and ravaging rivers of the financial sector before finally coming to rest in the bank accounts of the higher-ups in the scheme. The bankers would, of course, skim a little bit off the top for themselves in exchange for the efforts and their discretion. Tachi and Kodera took down names and made notes of the most egregious offenders. They were clueless for now, upstanding members of society. For the time being, the detectives would smile and act as if nothing was wrong. Retribution would come for these criminals, and there were many layers to this crime. Time for some coffee. It's time to prep the papers. There's no doubt at all that trying to take down the department's biggest competitor would raise suspicions in the government. It could be easily seen as a hit job, a move to usurp power rather than a legitimate operation. The detectives had to do everything they could to ensure that that did not happen. They could not afford to lose anything here. They were treading on thin ice, and they had to make sure their legitimacy was unquestionable and their motives completely publicly pure. There are also so many papers and documents that it would take a normal team months to fully abridge and comb through them, but Tachi and Kodera had already done more than a normal team could ever do. They found several highlights that would hopefully make a bulletproof case against the Kenpai Tai. The weapon trade alone should have been enough to convince everyone that something fishy was going on, but these were not normal times. The two detectives had to reinforce their case with another major point, the money. It always seems to come back to the money and crime. The cash that had suspiciously been making its way in and out of the Kenpai Tai was not normal in any way. It would be absolutely darning or damning once properly documented and backed up. Tachi and Kodaira began assembling files containing all the evidence that could be ever needed. This would be a hard fight. Good work, boys. Good work, everyone, and hush the officers now. Kodera had a very, very difficult, hard task ahead of him. The Tokyo Police Department had been a very, or rather inappropriately close with the Kenpai Tai for decades now, a result of bureaucratic failures and an unfortunate ability by either side to properly do their jobs without support. This relationship was deep, and it meant that many, if not most of the department, would not be happy with any action that could damage that relationship. Kodera had the unfortunate job of finding the right allies within the department and making sure that all worries were kept at bay, even if those worries were completely justified. Kodera spoke to several colleagues, and each time assuring them that this was simply routine and there was no need to, for any worry. He made sure that everything he said would be sound fine once it was inevitably relayed to the Kenpai Tai by some loyal crony in the department. The remaining ways, the real audience of his talks as such, they were perfectly tailored to make the Kenpai Tai as unsuspecting as possible and the raid as viable as it could be. Kodera had to admit he felt like he had done a pretty good job. Seating a lie with the intention that it would be carried to another party was a skill that few could master, but he was no stranger to it. By the end, he was cautiously optimistic that he had bought enough time for everything to be properly done. He has a silver tongue. And please, keep building. Build, build, build. Japan depends on you to build. Wow, minus four babillion. Babillion, we can still hear you saying. Tachi poured over yet another paper. He had hardly slept for weeks at this point, and catching a few hours here and there and missing important things when he did. They were too far in. At this point, he could not afford to miss anything, and he could not afford to be as tired as he was. The eternal paradox of a detective. As tired as his eyes tore apart each line and searching for anything of note, he noticed a name that seemed familiar. Reading further, he realized it was a major general, bigger than anyone else implicated so far. He had seen his name... 
uh, in the paper earlier for getting some metal. He quickly made a note of it and realized with, with dread how big this case was growing. Over the next few days, big names like that started popping up more and more often. Evidence continued to flow non-stop, and Kodera and Tachi kept finding truly major figures in places they had no right to be. This was getting bigger than either of them could have ever thought. Their shock and worry grew even bigger. Names started to show up, and something they thought impossible. People at the very center of the government. High-ranking politicians in the diet. People who could potentially be prime minister someday. People with more power than they could ever dream of. These two detectives had a distinct feeling that they were punching up. This is worse than we could have ever imagined. Oh boy. Oh boy. Please don't let it come crashing down, though. That wouldn't be bad, especially because I love my annual income rate. 54%. Nice. You would never break the chain. The names just kept coming. The less kept growing every day, and it started to look like less like a chain and more like a massive web of generals, politicians, officers, and now to top it all off, admirals. As evidence continued to flow, it started to become clear that this was not just an army operation. The Navy was apparently willing to put its differences with the ground forces aside in the name of mutual profit, the eternal motivator. The entire military was compromised, it seemed, and a good chunk of the government to go along with it. Tachi and Kodera had gone from worry to completely panic. Now they were dealing with not one but two different branches of this military police who would be absolutely annihilate them if they found out what the two detectives were doing. They realized that they had to act faster than they had thought before. Each minute that ticked by, their enemies got closer to finding out what they were planning. Each day was another chance that agents of the Army, Navy, or government itself would bust through the door and arrest them, or worse. There was not much time left. The raid had to happen as humanely as possible, or humanly as possible. We're in the end game now. End game? Oh, look. Well, oh, we have negative stability. Holy crap. I did not realize we could actually get negative. But with the glory of the sphere, nothing bad could happen. Look at that political power. Nothing bad could happen. The riches continue. Now that we solved our economic problems, we can focus on more pressing matters such as the military or social policy. The system we built has a troublesome foundation, but that should concern us for now. It'll take years until the cracks start to show, and by then we'll be in a much better position to work on the underlying issues. Until then, we can lie back and enjoy the splendid results of our little kaikaku. Ah, yes, our economy will show the world what it could truly become. Thumbs up and time for some coffee. Nothing bad could come happen here. The team leader, though. Everything hinged on this raid. Subsequently, everything hinged on the leader. He wouldn't have a coward at the head of such a monumental event, an event that could change the course of Japan as a nation. He needed someone he could trust, someone who wasn't entangled in the conspiracy. A police officer would not do. They couldn't be trusted with a gun, let alone the most important raid in the history of the East. A soldier was not the one to get it done either. He just followed the orders of the state and killed some civilians along the way. It had to be detectives. Kodera and Tachi jumped out. Tachi was a sprightly, native, uh, naive Osaka transfer. Certainly quick with a handgun and quick quick with spirit, but he wasn't experienced with commanding groups and not a cynic like every other officer in Tokyo. The boy was used to small town Yakuza activities in Osaka and didn't have much dirt on his hands. Most importantly, he's a meticulously careful planner. Nothing will go unthought of or written or unwritten. Certainly a good choice. On the other hand was Kodera, old, broken, cynical. Thus, the blood on his hands never dried and his rage against the corruption of the state. The corruption that killed so many never ceased. He was a loose cannon. But perhaps exactly what the raid needed was a loose cannon, hardened by the labyrinthian alleys of Tokyo. He didn't break or collapse into under anything short of death, and he knew how to lead a team from years of practice. It was taking a risk in a man who had no reason to trust the state. Perhaps it was worth it take in a time like this. We gotta go with Kaidera. Tachi, he's young. He's naive. Kodaira? I keep saying his name. Kodera. 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 Kodera is a guy for the job. We gotta get Kodara. Kodaira. Mr. K. Detective K. Who are we gonna call? Detective K. I don't wanna cl click on this because that means we need to actually make this stuff. Yeah, it does help out with air support and stuff, but, you know, still. Ooh, special defenses. Training time. C capacity multiplier and less division training time. I want more defense, soft stack, and organization. Quality, quality, quality soldiers, my friends. I wonder how low our stability can go. Hmm. Raid planning equipment. We pray that the bullet will not be used in this raid as sensibly to an information gathering mission. If our raid a barely condoned secret plan was to result in the death of an officer or civilian, it certainly mean, mean the end of any real resistance to the conspiracy that has gripped every level of the state. The corruption in the crimes as a result of the corruption will continue unfettered while law enforcement sits by the wayside. Therefore, death is not an option. Still, we must bring weapons. If a soldier resists our raid, there is no option but to fire back, if not for our own self defense. The argument remains as to what happens or what weapons will to bring. Anything too strong will both be cumbersome and conspicuous. Something too small might mean the stopping power won't be able to punch through the plate armor of the soldiers. A few of the more police minded traditional officers su simply suggest bringing along standard weaponry from the armory, like riot shields, pistols, and small submachine, submachine guns. These are readily available, and officers are certainly familiar with them. However, they're not designed for use against military units with heavy armor being used to control civilians and criminals. A few detectives and specialized officers decided or suggested. What they see is an obvious solution. Use military-grade weapons against military-grade troops. Semi-automatic rifles are, are also in the Tokyo Armory for use against heavier, well-armed targets. The high caliber would cut through the armor but used by soldiers like butter. A couple issues remain. Bureaucracy would have to wade through to get these weapons, a bureaucracy drowning in corruption. Officers aren't trained in these weapons in the slightest. Heavy training will be required. And even this, they won't be as skilled in comparison to earlier weapons. The fight fire with fire, bring out the rifles. Light weapons are familiar. Oh, but this is all things go poorly. 
But why would we attack under quick? We gotta bring fire, fire with fire. You tell me the police officers aren't armed with, or trained with firearms like with rifles or long rifles or long barrels. Son, what type of police training is that? The entry method. Plants litter the floor of the complex. Occasional wind would send papers sprawling and staffers chase vainly after them. But most of the important information had been taped down and written in scrawling notes, curling and dipping around the edges. A back door here, a hidden room there, an armory just in the corner in the range of the alarm system's trigger, a section of the fence where the weeds grew just tall enough to disguise, if necessary, a human-sized object in the foliage. The raid took shape. One action at a time, one new maneuver after another. Ten soldiers were used for planning. Kodera and Tachi, having both worked the man to physical exhaustion by putting them through drills and punishing or pushing them to use a psychological brink, uh, to the psychological brink in the endless cycles of paperwork. Thankfully enough, only two of them were needed for the decision confronting them, and all in all probability, just one of them could have done the job better. Would the raid use a frontal approach in military action, or would it attempt to infiltrate the areas of inactivity and low surveillance? Auxiliary military police forces could handle themselves best in direct conflict situations, and Kodera. Uh, recommended a sharp, short entry into the compound. The schedule would be short and casualties would be limited. Tachi, on the other hand, advised that an indirect approach would allow for mis minimization of casualties and also allow for more accuracy on on the ground actions. Both were valuable degrees of, su of suitable, but only one option could be taken. We're gonna go all in, bust in, and find the goddamn evidence. Give him a warning. We wanted the jig to be up. We're gonna go with Kodera. This is probably really bad. We're gonna really be escalating this whole event. That's probably not a good idea, but you know what? As long as we can discover the corruption and get Eno out of office and put in the liberal candidate, that'll be good. King Farouk is dead. Shocking. Going in, the rain fell heavy upon Kodera, who leaned against the chain fence outside the decrepit warehouse surrounded by dozens of heavily armed law enforcement officers. The night sky above them was gloomy and dark, and the light of the twinkling stars barely penetrated the lick thick layer of smoke and clouds hanging above them. Light rain fell like a cold mist over his beige trench coat, chilling him with an anxious anticipation. He took, off the, he took the last puff of the cigarette and tossed it to the ground before stamping, it, stamping on it and holstering, unholstering his handgun. Yellow street lights down the dark and twisted alleys around them flickered until only the source of light came from the weak glow behind the cracked glass towards windows of the warehouse. He nodded it to Detective Tachi and the commanding officer to approve of his readiness and cocked his gun. The raid on the compound suspected of holding incriminating evidence in the IJA investigation was within this building, and it seemed it was the responsibility to gather it safely and securely. With martial dexterity and organized speed, the officers descended into the building in the cover of the night. Armed in dark black uniforms and with weapons to quiet then to quiet and quieten those who dare violate the deadly veil of silence. We won't have long. Get it done. Oh boy, things are gonna go crazy now. That's a good point. Point one eight though. Point eight one. Point eight one. Point eight one. Man, how long is this gonna go? Looking around, a few moments in, the officers had separated into small teams and were clearing the great warehouse at high speeds. They rushed into the rooms, hallways, and cupboards with beaming torches at the end of their rifles to scour the four walls of any room and facility they could find. Scrounging up evidence behind the trail of law enforcement, Detective Tachi flicked through files and picked up scattered sheets that looked to be somewhat useful to now potentially deadly investigations. Although he seemed composed and trusting of the officers, he was desperately repressing his fears and unbearable tension. This was the most radical of the IJA they were dealing with, those who did not fear death in the slightest. Twinging and... With his eyes departing from side to side, Tachi continued to flick through anything of, that was of use while lagging behind the ra raiding parties, remaining very aware of his surroundings. He was visibly sweaty, with droplets on his forehead and a dry throat. Moments later, as he continued to follow officers like a small and timid child trying to prove his resource resourcefulness, there was an unusual sound coming down from a dark and damp hallway. Tachi turned his head in an instant, and a deafening silence followed. The officers lowered their weapons to glance at Detective Kodera before ga gazing down the hallway where the unusual sound originated. A million thoughts gushed through Mr. Tachi's head, and he called before reaching for his sidearm. Prepare yourselves. Oh boy, oh boy, what's gonna happen? What is gonna happen? Oh man, oh man. This crime novel's going nuts. It's long, but it's kind of okay that it's long. It's very, very detail-oriented. So whoever did this and developed this, thank you. Uh, the encounter. The officers slightly marched over to the door where the noise originated from and prepared themselves to forcefully enter and investigate the strange sound, but as they pressed themselves up against the wall, they could hear a small chatter. Detective Tachi, who was a sw small distance from behind the officers, held his pistol up and ready to shoot, teetering on the edge of panicking as he heard the crackling of fire. The commanding officer nodded at his men and began to count with his fingers in a grim and harrowing silence. In a great crash, the officers burst through the door and flooded the room with glaring torches and threatening yells of violence. There was a thick smell of metal and gunpowder, as well as the oily smell of burning papers and plastics. The IJA men in the dimly lit and damp room, caught in the process of incinerating piles of what seemed to be incriminating evidence, instantly darted their heads towards a weak door, flying off its engines and leaping from the seats. With law enforcement charging towards them, they staggered across through the corners of the room to grasp any kind of weapon or sharp object, and as Detective Tachi followed in, he skidded across the floor and frantically dashed to find cover. Put your hands where I can save them. Ah, uh, you're under arrest. In the name of the Empire. That'd actually be kind of cool. Put your hands where you can see them in the name of the Empire. You have a right to ma remain silent. Except for now. Do they have any rights like that? 
60s, Japan. No, oh, anyways. The panic. It happened almost in slow motion for Detective Kodera as he dashed into the room the police were raiding. He had skidded on a gasoline spillage on the wet floor and he was able to survey the room for a slight moment. For a second, his eyes were wide and their bodies sprung into action like animals in the wild. The reflexes kicked in to save them from their bludgeoning. After that incident, however, a great blaze erupted from the far corner of the room as one of the men kicked over the burning fuel used in incendiary documents, destroying much of the evidence in a hellish inferno. Mr. Kodera was thrown back by the small blast and he gathered his senses among the shouts and cries of the law enforcement agents scuffling around the room. His attention returned to the now armed criminals. They had scurried behind the old tattered furniture and debris with handguns and knives, but as Kodera reached for his pistol, he realized what they had planned, what they had planned and he let out a great yell, Don't shoot, they're not out to kill. Law enforcement officers charged past Detective Kodera with a brute force to subdue the men, throwing them to the ground but lather stacks of dilapidated furniture. His view was blurry and waning. He was nauseous and dizzy, barely able to make sense of the chaos unfolding around him. He crawled to the floor cover and could barely breathe until his vision locked with the lifeless eyes of the IJA troop he'd just been looking for. A short blade protruded from his stomach, the troop had committed suicide before he could be captured by law enforcement, and he died with the last remaining evidence that could be salvaged from the disaster, blood trickling through the old wooden floorboards towards Kodera. Kodaira. He remained still on the ground, dazed and shocked. The other men had died too, taking their lives in similar ways before they could be arrested. Now the darning silence. My apologies about that. I don't know why, but I clicked the uh, end record button. But regardless, the day of blood, the blood curling yell of a brave death echoed throughout the warehouse. And then a deep silence fell over the numbingly alert officers. Detective Tachi gulped. His hands were quivering with his pistol shaking between his fingers as he looked over the bloody conundrum of suicide sprawled across the dark wooden floor. Kodiara. Kodiara. Actually, that was his name. K-O-D-I-A-R-A. Kodera climbed up to a stable stance and his eye, wide eyes scoured the room of terrific mess of bodies as the officers gazed at. No one dared to speak, not even to issue a command to wrap up their operations. The sun of crackling fire was broken up by the sudden cost of Mr. Kodera, who approached Tachi from behind and patted him on the back as his eyes were fixated on the ghastly horror of the failure. The officers had already left the room, but the Tachi's shock had captured him in an immovable and awesome stance. He rubbed his tired eyes and darted his vision towards Kodiara, who nodded and sighed, signaling for them to both leave the room and escape the sight of the grisly remains. Some time had passed since the final incident, and Kodiara, Kodiara had, had reached to light another cigarette in the fresh air. Offering Tachi one, he sighed and puffed out a great big breath of tobacco-rich smoke, bringing him a slight relief of the better awe of the failed incursion. With most of the evidence gone and the criminals dead, Kodiara... Uh, stared aimlessly with the feet into the many misty rain that glittered in the night sky. He looked back to Tachi, who leaned or Tashi, who leaned against a brick wall with wide eyes and was biting his lip. Kodiara scoffed and took another breath of his cigarette before returning his vision to the thick clouds that lined the sky. It's a terrible day for rain. And also, we did finish the riches continue. We'll see what happens. Now we're getting a lot of political power. 1.8. Ah, that's that's a good amount. It's not a lot, but it's, it's a good amount. Sympathetic tra to tradition. Cool. Recovering from the unrecoverable. The light of die the, blah, 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 the light of dawn hit the base, but it still stayed. Corpses lay on the ground, covered with blood as if they fought to the last moment. It was not until about noon that a tenuous peace set in place. There was no more need for fighting, now it was just a time for collecting the bodies and mourning, not just the mourning of the casualties, but the implication of the casualties. The raid had failed and the department had lost. Justice would not shine, even though it's death of its forebears. There was little hope at this point. All the detectives could do was try to move on, as hard as it may seem, they would continue the fight even if it killed them. The military officials were undoubtedly excited and terribly disappointed. Sure, they covered their butts, but at what cost? At what cost to their legacy? At what cost to their troops? Perhaps most importantly, at what cost to their enemies? They had the intention to exploit, but not murder. They weren't looking for a war, they were looking for money, plain and simple. The bodies buried in quiet ceremonies. The reason of death is not given, but a he healthy pension is given to the families of the deceased. The investigation is dead. Oh, he's got no support. Oh, man. So, we screwed up then. Which is not good. So, we'll go as far as we can. If there's really bad things that we can't get... I'm sure we can get Takagi in, but... I don't know... Let's see. Yep. What if I lower Miki support right now? Oh, that's good. Kido? I don't want to launch a slander campaign. Oh, even Eno's got some more support now. Wow, look at that. Eno has, like, no support. And look who does. Mr. Taki. Burying the men up. Hundred funerals were planned. On both sides, there were those regarded as heroes and villains. Visuals of companions and comrades attended each one, silent and mourning. Rain pelted down in the tears of someone above, and a quietness settled upon it all. It was a time for violence, but now is the time to reflect on the pessimism of the past, the actions of the present, and the optimism of the future. Absolute silence. One point. Wow, that's really bad. Tactical support. Don't mind if we get some more tactical support with organic units. I guess we shouldn't have gone in with, like... I didn't realize that they would kill themselves. I really didn't. So, maybe we should have gone in with submachine guns? Like, 
light weaponry, but survey the wreckage. From the outside, the building looked as if it had been in perfect condition. There was little that bellied the horde interior, but a few bullet holes scattered on the facade. Inside was a mess of scattered paper, ashes, and bodies rotting in the humid air. Rodents scrambled about looking for a cut of the meat. A few expeditions have been conducted to gain bodies, but nothing more. The bowels of the base still laid untried and since a siege. They smelled of rotten poop and flesh. The unknown called to no one, and Zero volunteered to see what was inside. Eventually, a squirmy officer was pushed in. He emerged stinking with the same stench of those rooms, but brought news of what lay inside. The foul cabinets were empty, the evidence inside vanished. This would not do. The police could not have gotten a hold of them. They would not. The rooms had smell of death and have missing evidence. Oh boy. It ain't over until minus 16. Holy bad word! Doing that last focus really helped us out. Growth is still the same. Our GDP and debt is still the same. But we're going to salvage what we can. The officers were furious, or officials were. Even though the raid was resolutely failed, the detectives had gotten away with too much. They weren't sure whether the police would put it all together, but they weren't gambling on it. Action must be taken in quick. One raid wouldn't set this whole house of cards tumbling down, would it? Hopefully not. I just want to pay off debt, man. Pay off our debts to build a better future for our, for, for our children so the Japanese can continue very successfully. Hey, look, we must be done uh, doing naval stuff. Rotten soldiers, money, ships. Ergun takes over the Levant, huh? The Jews have found their Zion, but at what cost? Day by day, the crowds gather around the headquarters of the Army and Navy group. Since the press release, the public had been up in arms, and rare was a day that passed without an attack on a high-level military officer. Police officers could no longer intervene. The hate was mutual, and the internal police was fighting for its life. The IJA and N were, for all intents and purposes, dead in the water. Cut. Co Kodaira and Tachi should have been celebrating at this point. Their prime targets have been proven demonstrably guilty, but two uh, niggling issues haunted them and two loose ends begging for a resolution. The first was drawn from the use of several code words drug drawn from conversations and interrogations with various military staff, the names of the famous cultural landmarks. Kamakura Buddha, Kyoto Golden Temple, Kyoto Silver Temple. All code word owners were, were spoken of in a deferential tone and appeared to have pulled strings behind the string pullers. But the transactions traceable to these code words accounts did not correspond to the army or navy. In fact, even the Imperial General Headquarters appeared to be innocent. So who was above the headquarters? The second was this. The Army and the Navy, the civilian government's biggest enemies, were busy collapsing, so why the civilian government failing to piece together along with them? And did anyone really want to know the answer? I don't like where this is going. But I'd like to get this stuff, please. Please. The Private Commission. Oh, we got some divisions, though. Oh, yes, very nice. The press room was running from consecutive days of public hearings, but not from sweat or exhaustion. The scent of fear was heady, and it was everywhere. The team wore the expressions of children with their hands caught deep in the cookie jar, ironic given the circumstances, but nobody was laughing. Co Codera's speech was short to the point of curtness. To prevent further internal inf interference, a private commission would be set up with the facilitation of the Tokyo Metropolitan and granted extraordinary powers to search, arrest, and interrogate all across the branches of the government. It was the will of the Emperor, and here, pause for emphasis, that the investigation reached just conclusions. Scarcely had the meeting ended when a note was passed to him by a staffer. It was impossible even to catch his disappearing outline in the crowds of journalists. Co Codera opened the note, noting the letterhead. Stop before you were encircled and destroyed. Your fight was brave, but it ends here. We are watching. Yours, the Thousand Temples. Baffled, he raised his head just in time to catch Tachi's cry. Codera, our leads are in the Navy, are in trouble. Orders from the Diet, assigned to Fus Fusoshima. Where, where the heck is that? Isn't that up here? Oh, that was Fukushima. Oh, yeah, that, that yeah. Um, Fukushima? Uh, I don't know. I don't know my Japanese geography that well, so. Wow, 1.4 billion? Oh, yes. Further, faster, deeper. Wow. Uh, that sounds like a title of a certain type of movie. But as the team hastily remember, resemble, reassembled their work, d damage reports confirmed the worst. Some kind of purge was taking place in the Army and Navy ministries, and it was being directed not by the command staff, but from the dizzying heights of civilian bureaucracy. Some of the prominent leaders had been caught up in the chaos. Something was very wrong. Kodera and Tachi were running out of time. The crisis meeting stretched into the long hours. Many on the team had let their unspoken fears take a hold of them, and wanted to shut down the investigation before their own heads would wound up on executive platters. What emerged was the consensus that the work had, done, had to be done quickly as possible to attempt to attempt to outflank the government. Arrest warrants and lists of suspects were hastily compiled and the team divided into ministry sections to tackle each list to hit the government as hard as they could. If they couldn't manage a full sweep of the Thousand Temple, they could at least nab enough of them to kill momentum. Nobody said the obvious, but it was on their minds regardless. Time was the only insurance they had left, and the results had to come in before their own arrests did. The Japanese police had a 99% conviction rate, even for their own men, were working on a god darn lives. Ho oh boy. Ho oh boy. Anything else here? I should focus more on infrastructure, but we're good. Actually, don't do that one. There you go. 15, not bad. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Good, good, good. The resistance with from without. 
No one was sure how long or when the low grade civil war brewing in the diet and the imperial government at large had quieted to a simmer, but somehow the worst had passed. Nobody knew why, but most of the team were thankful that the world around them had remained somewhat intact, even as the military fell apart. It was reassuring to know that Japan had become a military state and was in fact increasingly unlikely to do so given the state of its armed forces. One evening, a letter was received from the imperial general headquarters, an anonymous transcript and a generic government-issued letterhead. It was similar to in content to countless other missives received that week, all of which ordered the team to cease and desist under the pretext of protecting the dignity of the Emperor. What was different was what came after. The signage of the letter read like a who's who of the most powerful members of the Imperial government. Senior members of the Diet and Cabinet, the Army and Navy, and the headquarters itself had all penned signatures in person. Codera's files indicate that half of these individuals were embroiled in intrigue against each other in the upper heavens of the government's chambers. If this were the case, how did they end up signing the same petition? The answer arrived in the form of a team from the headquarters the following week, brandishing a warrant for immediate audit of suspected treasonous activities against the Emperor. As he searched the office, ignoring the cries of the already overburdened investigation team, Cordero found in the warrant the seals of a half dozen major ministerial appointments, but above them all was a thick, unmistakable seal of the Kokusai's council. It was now clear to everyone who the Thousand Temples were, and why the government had closed ranks. What could be done to stop them, however? My good lord, how deep does this run? But we have betrayal from on high. Everyone knew that the Bureau of Public Order, in theory the civilian police representative of the Emperor, was in a reality a fire weather friend of the juniors. The Bureau seldom did its assigned work these days, focused instead on arcane power games and the Byzantine structure of the Empire. Even so, nobody had quite expected the face, or the about face, the Bureau now made. In, order to, in orders crafted to maximize humiliation, the Bureau essentially dressed down the entire team, bracketing above their pay grade, station, and status before the Emperor. This was fairly normal treatment and to be expected, but what surprised the team was a blunt demand of the corpus of the investigation evidence and all to be moved to bureau headquarters and safe kept, or safe kept for an indefinite period. The reason cited were the preservation of the dignity of the government and the emperor, as well as need to safeguard potentially sensitive data, uninspiring but effective. In ordinary circumstances, the orders ordering them to stop could at least have been published, but this order was classified so highly that to release it would have been made an immediate death sentence for most of Kadera and Tachi's team. It was an outrage and an impediment of justice, but you couldn't admire the handiwork. Days and confused, the team halted work. A missive seething with rage and vitriol was drafted, redrafted, and hastily sent to the shredder before it could do any harm. Stabbed in the back, and they're to blame. Oh boy. Wow, Eno has lost even more support. We're going to cut down on Miki. Oh, we can't do this yet. Every, every 14 days. Oh, we did it. Cool. We're going to really make these guys very popular. Nice. The government lockdown. Codero is tired. Even by the standards of the Metropolitan Police of the Jewel of the East. Oh. A sleepless man for the sleepless city, dancing on the edge of collapse, the investigation and months of his team's time appeared to be slipping into the gutter, and it was little he could do to stop it. He was reminded of the old stories of children playing with the gods, pretending at equal states or status. He poured through the documents, the seals on the letter to correspond to the senior positions of the government, but they seemed to have come from elsewhere. An analysis of the seals' imprints revealed that this was a wax used for financial purposes. Why had the letter been stamped with accompanying seals rather than executive ones? And what did this mean for the investigation? A cursory search of the invoicing records the team had captured revealed nothing. All the seals that they had on record corresponded to senior executives whose names they already knew in the ministries that slated for audit. Pictures of contracts they had captured revealed nothing as well. The seals' identity and function eluded him. Codera worked throughout the night, chasing the paperwork and expanding spirals, and by the next morning he had an answer for a very confused Tachi. The seals on the letter had been found in the Minizaka records they seized in the fishing... Uh, factory. And the peculiar thing was that the seals hadn't been bound in isolated one or two places. Out of 371 documents seized by initial investigation, 320 of them had a match for one or more seals used. It slipped past the initial investigation, and most government firms had ministerial seals for documentation and approval, but could no longer be ignored. The government wasn't above the scandal, it was right there in the mud with the rest of them. Another set of criminals to chase. Oh boy, that is crazy. What's going on? The facade cracks. They trained Tachi in rudimentary middleman tactics and hostage negotiation seminars, but Tachi had never expected to use them like this. Two teams of the most powerful agencies in Japan were snapping at each other, with members of his own team desperately trying to get both sides to stand down, hands to holsters. The police department held its breath. The Imperial General Headquarters had sent a team of specialist bureaucrats to commandeer what evidence could be taken to safeguard it for the Emperor's protection in a facility guarded by themselves. It was an unfortunate event that they had happened to meet a team from the Bureau of Public Order sent to commandeer what evidence could be taken for the exact same purpose. Now they glared at at each other, the team heads practically throwing warrants at each other in efforts to prove the other an inferior in carrying out the Emperor's will. Looking at the two of them, Tachiya had an idea. Didn't the art of war say that enemies were best defeated when they when divided? And didn't they possess significant reserves of evidence that everyone wanted, but only one agency could keep? The plan formed in his mind and festered through the rest of the day in a full-blown strategy. If they could pull it off, survival would be a possibility, and some hope was better than none at all. Divide, conquer, survive. And there goes part of Madagascar. Good job, guys! And death of Mr. T 
Thailand. Terror for the sake of love. Chinks in the armor. At this point, the team was so used to overnight meetings, called it an hour's notice that scarcely anyone really cared about the infringement on a personal time. Between ten or so members gathered only a couple of children, and all were so exhausted by the investigative efforts that few had actually visited their, their parents in the months. Even so, they hoped perhaps this would be the last push, the final struggle to some imagined victory, and as the details were laid out in the flickering flames or the lights of the room, that hope only grew. Kodara and Tachi reorganized the team for the umpteenth time, focusing on three major conflict vectors under the ragged Imperial umbrella, the Bureau of Public Order, the Die, and the Army, and the Navy. The latter were undergoing a full-scale internal reorganization, complete with occasional gunfight, but still possessed enough internal cohesion to be a potential threat to the other two. And the plan was simple at heart. Turn the three agencies against each other in such a way that conflict would escalate and spill into the courts, forcing the release of the documents they needed. The Georgian horse lay ready for entrance into the three separate Troys, a series of invoices with sealed from all three agencies with Minazaka Logistics, Army Money, and Navy Shipping. More than enough to nab all three, but just enticing enough to convince each agency to fight the other two for ownership. And if all three agencies were to be seduced at the same time, Tachi smiled. It was time to turn the government upside down. One last roll of the die. One last gambit. Very good. We'll see what happens. And you will be done soon on June 19th. Not bad. False wave, false hope at the soldiers. Codera's contacts in the military had dried up faster than a Saharan drought after the investigation started to have real repercussions. But he knew that they were one of the last hopes for the two detectives. The entire government and the military were gunning to seize evidence and shut down the investigation, and Codera's knew, and Codera knew that they were fall far in too deep to let this go now. He would see justice or die trying, and they would only take any and he would take any help he could get to see that happen. Serve his old contacts, people he had once considered true friends, flat out refused to meet with them. Eventually, however, he had met with a few of them, and those who knew there was no other option. The offer was simple. They and their soldiers in the army and navy would safeguard evidence per pertinent to the investigation. In return, their reputation could still be safeguarded, and perhaps they would survive and make it to the other side after this whole debacle settled down. Every time he made the offer, he knew it was a lie, but the people he talked to were so desperate for any chance to escape that they agreed. Even hope that they knew deep down was false and was better than the chasm that faced them currently. Codera just wished that they had never put themselves in the situation in the first place. One last favor, old friends. Now we shall wink at the bureau. Wink, wink. Tachi was tired. He had been working nonstop for little months now. He truly could not remember the last time he had slept properly. He'd gotten five hours of sleep a few weeks ago, and it felt like an eternal slumber compared to what was usually running on. This general tiredness made it extremely difficult to conduct a proper meeting with an outside representative, which was exactly what Tachi was trying to do. A lot hung in this meeting, and if the Bureau chose not to comply, it could be the straw that broke the camel's back. Tachi decided to go for this entire ordeal to cut the crap and cut and talk frankly. No more flowery language and dancing around what was really on the table. He set up the offer as so. The Bureau of Public Order would assist in the storage and safekeeping of evidence so that hostile and potentially corrupt forces within the government could not seize them. In exchange, Tachi promised that if the evidence was not secured, then the investigation could be turned to politically benefit the Bureau. His upfront manner surprised the people he was meeting with, but the response was promising. They continued their endless game of double meanings and non-incriminating vague half-statements, but Tachi was able to gather that they were accepting the deal. He left the building with a tad of optimism and resolved to take the nap some time. They might just help us. So, okay, another one. Smile the ministers. The office was transparent, appeasement at the best. That was really the best that could be managed, and given the dire states that every branch of the government was even in, an offer like this could be easily be the best one the diet might receive. After all, they were on the brink too, and they would have to take any opportunity possible to try and save themselves, as what seemed like the entire government collapsed around them in the boiling sea of corruption and disorganization. Their proposal was simple. If worded to be long-winded and noble to flight of the diet, given the conflicts of interest elsewhere in the government and the possibility of further damage, the diet was best organization left to safeguard evidence regarding the investigation. The cooperation would surely shield them from much of the upcoming chaos, and their assistance would prove their dedication to justice and the innocence of many Diet members. They safeguarded the evidence from the corrupt and prying eyes elsewhere in the government and Navy, reaping all the benefits of doing so. Tachi and Cordero had worded the letter to be just right, hopefully appealing to the sense of urgency and desire to remain safe that the Diet members all felt. They hoped that it would be enough to win an ally, at least for the moment. Flattery is an ever-powerful tool. I keep checking back here, but I keep realizing that we get an event literally once every day, almost. So we release the bait. As Tachi spoke into the microphone, Kodera anxiously waited aside. His voice troubled with the sense that every word he gave to the radio waves would be echoed in Japanese history forever. The inner circle of the government and the investigation team selected to release the transaction invoices, history, and extensive documentation is not an all airtight one. Yet the extraordinary circumstances they cite threaten the future of the entire nation itself. He ends the broadcast and sends the files to the officials listening in shock, and less than an hour later, the three agencies were set aflame. With the crimes of the Army Navy and Dutt implicated with dozens of pieces of evidence for every transgression, the government hearings have been filed and are already set in order to acquire the damning records. The halls of Tokyo are filed with the disorganized shouting and the exasperated screaming of those named, each agency clamoring for its access, giving each a different reasons as to how they are to fit to secure it, for the good of the Japanese people and the Emperor. It seems as if their desperation will be for naught. Can there even be a victor? 
Well, as long as we don't die in the process, and Japan doesn't fall apart, that's probably the most important thing. The beloved uh, Camellia Lady. The orchestral opening of a somber mood to the audience in the bar, even for those who some were already drunk. Mi Jad Fa Mi ja faced the audience, uh, any fear leaving her as she began to sing. Endless nights in pain, with heart torn apart, none know how many tears a Camellia Lady cried. I'm not going to sing that for you, maybe some other day. Tears formed in many eyes as Mi uh, Ja retold the story of the, the Camellia Lady. A standing ovation. Uh, Hai Jia was next. Straightening her shining dress, she took the microphone from the attendant and made the customary bow. Rising from it, the music played from the speaker again. An upbeat tune played, giving the audience a jolt of energy. Hai Jia began to sing as the audience clapped to the tune. Please tell me like, tell me you like me. I can't get by without you. The audience danced to the song, some singing, others smiling, the lyrics of youthful love having touched their hearts. The crowd gave Hai Jia a standing ovation as before. Smiling at the reception, Hai Jia returned to the table, the rest of the musicians seemingly deep in conversation. Haija Si, do you want to go to Manchuria? A woman dressed in red approached Haija from the table. Mija, Manchuria? Haija's expression soured. Why would I want to die in that hellhole? It's not about working in the factories. Trust me, none of us want to do that. It's about performing elsewhere, somewhere better for us. M Mija's words rang true. She barely scraped by in Japan, and the homeland wasn't much better. When do you plan on leaving? When we have enough money. Divide, conquer, repeat. If there was ever any hope in this crisis being resolved, calmly and diplomatically it's gone now. The common front entrusted with... The information has completely collapsed upon itself. Governmental officials have fallen upon each other like a pack of sovereign rats are stalking and praying at night, sensing weakness in their brethren. The cultivating contacts in the, from the police have been put to effect and now offer to help out all three agencies with their pursuits. The giant bureaucracies and entities controlling Japan will soon find themselves trapped by the rules they made themselves. The agencies have already hastily granted wide open access to the investigations, police teams, moving quickly to secure all of the transcriptions. The hearings held themselves have resulted in a granting of access to voluminous incendiary materials surrounding the agencies dealing with each other. As all three smeared each other through with allegations and evidence, the hands of the puppet masters above will never be clean again. Let's see what kind of trouble they can get themselves into. Budget stuff? No. Only 17 billion minus. That's not bad. But never good enough. Trumbling down. Oh, hello. Tumbling down, Prime Minister Ino, implicated in making concessions in over 30 key areas of military autonomy, Deputy Ikeda Hayato, recently resigned, proven to accept hundreds of thousands of bribes. From Foreign Minister Fu Fujiyama Achiro to Security Minister Inukai Takaro, hundreds of more names from the Army, Navy, die, all complicit. They're desperate. Uh, scrambling to prevent the outflow of information horrifically failing the list of names only grows and those who desire to be in the know know now and it's only a matter of time before the endless headlines of newspapers will blare with the cries of corruption the pictures ears hearing past our best efforts at censorship the situation become evident that any hope of controlling the damage had been forgotten even if, if the past could ever be forgotten as the zaibatsu's began to collapse and the cabinet reached its end it seems as if a new era for japan is about to dawn what's done is done the government has let everyone in itself down it all returns to nothing return to monk cool over here, can we actually implicate anyone else here? Thank you. Nice, the liberal faction is doing very, very well now. So, trotting in the air. Sato turned the radio up, letting the soft musings of the violin, the pluckings of the guitar, and the whispers of the accordion guide her to sleep. Beams of light shone through a window, giving her warmth. She knew this song well, it was Street of Dawn, sang by to Toyota Nadeshiko. Sato let her eyes droop as Toyota began to sing through the speakers. Technically, it was illegal to be listening to this Korean or Korean music wasn't allowed on the radio, but something attracted her to the music. Her friend Kata had let her borrow some of her records, and she soon fell in love. The pleasant music stopped suddenly, replied by, or replaced by yelling, ripping Sato out of her sleep before it could even be started. Let go! What the F are you doing? A voice from what she could only presume was a radio personality, personality grunted out. A second later, a thou loud thud was heard. Saito blinked, simultaneously unsurprised and somehow surprised that this happened. She rubbed her temples. Now she would have to find another station that played her music. And there was probably more rest happening as she sat here. And what if the Toko knew that she listened to such music? What to do? What to do? She tuned into another station and lied down on the couch. <laughs> Alright, well, so much for that radio personality. And someone was appointed Prime Minister Thailand. The drums beat heavy. Good luck. Good luck. Good luck. The accountants knew. Everyone was afraid now. The central board was real with notes of various fonts and styles in the corridors. The rooms were trodden half to dust, and no one even dared to make small talk. The energy was channeled into work so frantic that it seemed like a burst of public madness. Talk veered and jolted between le talks of lead, and the next step, the agency to find. Caldera and Tachi found solace in their most recent routine. A properly conducted an accounting audit, and an uninvolved neutral agency had to be found. They devoted themselves to finding it with a book of the most influential auditing agencies and accounting firms in Japan in hand. They holed up themselves in the rooms for a week, working their way past the streams of data. Slowly, the web began 
began to unravel. The accountants involved had covered their tracks with exceeding competence, but certain irregular patterns were suspiciously similar to others, and if they could be proven to link to an accounting firm, the firm could be supposed to be compromised. The name of the firm was crossed out on the books, and the search would continue. Name by name, number by number, the anonymity of the accountable accountants began to collapse, and the list of the book grew shorter and shorter, and broke into pieces, which shrunk and shrunk and shrunk again. One day, Coderre woke up early, as his, well, so was his nature, and took a browse through the cross-written book in the hall, and then another, and then another. He managed with great effort to keep from screaming. Instead, he sunk into his chair, half sobbing to be found by a worried Tachi. Every single name in the book had been crossed out. Oh my lord. Holy crap. Uh, let's do Under the Mercury Lamps. Now, nah, let's do this one first. Things have been probably more important for this one. Things had been quiet for longer than they had been in weeks when a messenger appeared at the front of the department. His message was short and tersely delivered. The government would comply with the investigation to its fullest ability. He brought with him dozens of binders, each big enough to carry perhaps years worth of data. They were all quickly dropped off and the representatives left. Tachi and Kodera were quickly informed. They looked at each other for a moment, sharing a glance of simultaneous eagerness, fear, and confusion before quickly standing up and heading down to grab the byline grabbing the binders. All after a few trips back and forth to gather them all, they reached and grabbed the top binder from the stack and started to read. Both of the binders contained the same general kinds of info. It was not pretty. All the trans transcripts were true. Paper after paper documented truly staggering amounts of money flowing from the Navy and Army into the accounts of politicians. The further they read, the higher profile the names became. Soon they were no longer truly reading the reports, just skimming through them and noting every single name they came across. Not a single innocent person was mentioned from the front to the back. Kodera picked up another binder already having gone through several and started to read. This one was different, however. This did not document any suspicious transactions or politicians, at least not in the same way as the others. This was a full government-ordered report on the state of corruption. It had been chartered and viewed by the highest in the government and then tossed aside. A single note at the end stated that the report was to be archived in the same high clearance storage and forgotten for the security of Japan, no for the security of the people running it. The rot sinks deeper under the mercury lamps. Yu Jin rested on the cold stone bench, the wind blowing south through the garden in her arms. She cradled her grandchild, Silji, nestled softly in a white blanket. Her legacy, the tree standing behind her, rustled suddenly, startling her, which started startled Silji. On reflex, Yu Jin rocked her and cradled her to sleep. Yet she remained fussy, her short arms reaching towards the blue sky, sh soft shushing. No reassurances that everything was all right would calm the child as she cooed and called out to no one and, no and everyone. Yu Jin wondered what Silji would be like when she got older. Would she even see reach adulthood? Yu Jin shook her head, admonishing herself, but there was a far more immediate concern. What if her very own grandchild didn't understand Korean? What would happen then? She may be a baby now, but what about when she attends school? A song came into her head, a favor of hers, and sang it to Suji. When the mercury lamps bloom in the evening, Sujin's eyes swept the garden, bursting with bright flowers of white, red, and blue. She looked into the Sulji's eyes, the brightest flowers of all. I'm facing this path, and I'm used to walking alone with you. She carnished Sulji's Sulji's face, smiling down at her. The child smiled in return, showing her off her growing teeth. Yu Jin kissed her forehead, touching her nose. The soft light of a mercury lamp does not change. The wind picked up as Yu Jin rocked Sulji harder. She yawned as Yu Jin talked her further into the blanket, and now you don't seem to have as well. She chuckled as Sulji's eyes drooped further and further. Ah, ah, under the light of a mercury lamp. Sulji fell asleep, her only movement being her breathing. Yu Jin rose from her bench, walking to the nursery, placing Sulji into a cradle. Yu Jin rocked it slowly. She walked away, turning out the lights, and closed the door silently. Sweet dreams, child. Oh, so, one of the comments from the last video said, like, people were wondering what happened to the Korea. Most likely, it's just more of a Japanization project or process, like forcing the people here to become more and more Japanese. That's probably what we can probably all assume. And you are a fool. Not you guys, but according to the uh, event here. Uh. 102.5, 102.9, 106. The aging captain had figured it out to the relief of his younger age. The map laid before him detailed the situation. Red was on the black foot, or on the back foot, after having lost the ridge in the surrounding hill. Defenses already begin, had been established, and it was only a matter of time before the blue had achieved victory. Scribbles and thin arrows pinpointed potential weak spots as thicker arrows planned out against a finishing blow to Red. Just a little more, and they would win. Yet the captain was met not with sounds, but instead with music. What the heck is going on? He asked it, no one in particular. The music being played was actually good, all things considered. The sound of the trumpet, the strong voice, and the fact it was upbeat at all contributed to how good it was. Too bad it was interrupting his exercise. The captain turned the dial, controlling the frequencies. All were playing the same music. He heard a sticker from his right as the voice sang. To the Japanese-born captain, the lyrics were unintelligible. To the A, Taichu. The one was calling the captain a fool. And what's the matter with you? The captain pointed at the A. I know no, nothing, sir. The A stiffened, although his face betrayed him. The captain simply glared at him, gruffly telling the group to call off the exercise. The aides cleared out of the tent with Taichu, tai Chi, relieved that he was out of the captain's life or sight. He began humming the tune that he had ruined the exercise, bobbing his head to the chorus. You are a fool, you are a fool. He imagined addressing the captain in private, finally airing his grievances. You are a fool, you are a fool. The song in his head continued. You are the cold man who does not know my mind. Can I just pay off debt, please? Artillery barrage? Eh, that's okay. Hey, we actually have stability? No, that's actually minus 49%. Whoops. Ooh. 
Actually, we're losing. We're, we're still losing probably more political power every day. Preemptive strikes? Why not? We all knew Shinzo Sojima. Hey, he's back! He gave a brief resignation speech showing no emotion and leaving as quickly as possible. He was found in the morning dead for approximately four hours. He was on his side, kneeled over, or keeled over into a shallow pool of his own blood. His hands still gripped the hilt of a very old and expensive wazi. Waka Waki Sashi, a centuries old antique and one of his most prized possessions. His face was frozen in a sad frown, his eyes as dead as they had been when he announced his resignation. The police quickly rushed in to inform his son, but they found him missing too. There was a brief panic until it was discovered that he had skipped town on a plane less than half an hour after his body had been officially been found. He was on his way to India, officially on business, in truth, because the entire world was collapsing around him. There's little chance of catching him now, even less than reason in trying. Just a few hours later, yet another heap of documents emerged. The Minazaka Corporation was now shown to have almost certainly assisted the government, army, and navy with their operations. They'd used their business expertise and many assets to shuffle money around, skim just enough for nobody to notice, and kept anyone who might object off the scent. They'd even audited the vast majority of the accounts involved in order to keep suspicion at minimum. Every level of power was now implicated with solid evidence. Hardly an innocent soul remained. Let he who is without sin cast the first stone. Oh, man. I will not be casting any stones, I guess. Hey, there you go. We better enjoy this... De paying off uh, national debt. Oh, that felt so good. But that might be the last time we can actually do that. Because things are falling apart. Holy crud. And let the bodies hit the floor. I remember listening to that song so much when it first came out. Kodera poured a glass of whiskey for himself and immediately drank it down before pouring himself another and offering one to Tachi. The younger one warily accepted he had been avoiding alcohol as much as he could get over the past few days given the concentration needed for his work, but he just couldn't take it anymore. He took the glass with a mumble thanks and savored the harsh flavor. A less ranking officer poked his head in and delivered some more papers. Kodera initially tried to decline, just saying it's just to put on the side so they could get to it in due time, but the officer said this was different. This had just come from Eno Clique itself. That got Kodera to stand up and snatch the papers right from the officer's hands. He struggled to keep his eyes steady as he ran up and down the paper. He sighed and sat down before handing the tiny stack to Tachi. The younger detective read over them as well and looked to Caldera in shock. The clique was now agreeing to cooperate with the investigation fully. Anything the team asked for, as long as it was relevant to the case, was, would be delivered. All they wanted in exchange was a guarantee of safety. The Inu clique would be secure, and in return, everything and everyone would be fair game. Pour another glass. Holy crap. This is getting dangerous. Alright, so Kaya? Oh, uh, oh uh, how many more days do we have for this? Um, actually, how big... Oh, oh crap. In the name of love... 177 for the liberals, not bad. In the name of love! Fuljang Ziki. Nothing could be better than sitting in a record store and listening to the merchandise as a city Nanjing has ambled uh, on, on outside of her window. All the likes of businessmen, salarymen, and people looking just to get passed by her window. A growing pile of poems of the best prose she could muster stood tall on her desk, ready to collapse with the smallest breath touched it. Ziki was hunched over her desk, calculating how many sales she would have to make to cover rent. Deep in thought, her train of thought was broken by the ringing of chimes and the paper tower collapsed. Too slow to react, Ziki watched as a customer tried to save her stack of papers, uh, only for it to fall over to the floor. Looking up, she realized that a Japanese officer had just walked into her store. Pale face, she shot up. Do you need any help, sir? She cringed at her Japanese. I'm so sorry for causing that mess. Do you need any help? The officer seeming, seemed genuinely uh, apologetic and embarrassed. Ziki nodded. In a few moments, or seconds, the stack had been reassembled, then divided into chunks to avoid an incident. Do you happen to sell a trot? The officer asked anxiously. Ziki walked over to a rack, f filing through the record covers. There should be some Li Mija here. She pointed to another track. There's Kim Haija and Choi Suk Ja. The officer nodded, searching through the mass of covers. From the corners of her eye, Ziki could see him picking out a few records as she picked out ten. She left the records on her desk, telling him to, to her no, telling, telling him to let her know when he was done. He came over a few seconds later, holding a bunch of records in his arms. Is there any way you can package this? I'll pay extra. Ziki nodded, producing a box from under her desk. She placed the records in the box. That would be 500 yen. She got 550. As the man left the store, Ziki stopped him. Why did you buy Trot records anyways? Aren't they illegal? The officer raised an eyebrow, seemingly acknowledging her argument and smile only. They're for my wife. Huh. Okay, well, whatever works in the verdict. The final hearings were miserable affairs. Each one was just an hour after hours of details of the truly hideously, astoundingly corrupt affairs of every nearly branch of the nation. After they were completed, the last pieces of evidence had been finally officially compiled and reviewed and were incorporated into the report. The report was titanic, large enough to make one wonder if every citizen in the Empire was also being accused. After a final day of nervous preparations and finalization, the report was released. By the next day, literally hundreds of arrest warrants had been issued. Diet members, cabinet members, politicians, businessmen, previously admirable figures, all were stopped and brought in as mere criminals. They were joined by a staggering amount of generals, admirals, and officers, both major and minor. A good number were yet to be captured, and they continued to trickle in as the fallout grew harsher. The Minazaka Corporation was on the brink of absolute collapse. The vast majority of its remaining leadership has been incarcerated, and what little remained was extraordinarily unprepared to deal with this. It was a teetering and would be knocked over by a slight breeze or push, and this was more akin to the city shredding hurricane. 
Every sign pointed to a collapse in consumer confidence. There was no coming back from the Minazaka Corporation. There was no coming back for anyone. The hor horizon glows with fire. Not light. Oh, crap. No, not the... The men stood by the cell, calmly waiting for their turn to jump. Oh, no. Oh. Is that okay to read? Oh, Jap, Jap flavor, point four four by tea. Oh, God. The afternoon sun shone through the windows of Jisoo's apartment as 15 children were strewn about sitting on chairs or couch or cushions on the floor. Now repeat after me. Jisoo put the pointer on the chalkboard. Seagulls don't cry over the sea. The children leaned over to the board trying to read and mimic her. A deck or de desk creaked as it moved closer to the front of the room. S Seagulls don't cry over the sea. The students squinted their eyes, struggling, clearly struggling to read. The Jisoo stopped herself from yelling. These were just children who were learning. They would get it eventually. I hope you all study this because you're going to be reciting this to me one by one next week, she warned the students. And an unintelligible cacophony of affirmatives erupted from the students as Jisoo returned to the chalkboard. The pointer swept across the second line of the characters as Jisoo read. Tears are wet in the bowl, water bowl and the jogori. She read aloud. This time, her students read it nearly perfectly. Nodding, she moved on. A silent or small boat on the f small f blah, 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 my apologies. A uh, small boat on the far horizon. Oh, today you're not gone. The teacher pointed to the picture depicting exactly what she recited. A small boat on the far far horizon. Oh, today you're not gone. The students repeated. Nice work. I'll be picking on students to read a part of the lyrics. Woon he hyong ah, you go first. And so the students read the lyrics with Ji Soon giving feedback in between. Silji ya go a bit slower next time. At the last of the students left. Jisoo prayed. Prayed for the success, but also prayed they wouldn't forget where they came from. Don't forget. Don't forget. Obviously, this is from, uh, this is in Korea, and, uh, I need to go back to class, apparently, because I can even read this as well. But trotting across the Amnok, the Amnok tw twinkled in the sunlight as the snow melted, flowed, or snow melt, flowed to towards the west, where it would meet the ocean. In all our three, year three years of existence, Mi Jia had never been this far north. It had taken months of carefully giving its endless of saving and endless nights of singing to get here, but she would go farther than that. Her eyes scanned in the land in front of her, seeing concrete blocks, smokestacks, and scattered apartment, apartment buildings. As she squinted, she could barely make up the silhouettes of people. They seemed like ants in a hill. Soft fog obscured her view, or was it the pollution? With Manchuria, she couldn't tell. A voice carried or called out to her, breaking her moment of contemplation. A distant person waved, gesturing to the train station. She ran over. What was the train going to part? To part? The train's about to depart. Mi Jia took a moment to breathe. Yao Jia nodded before sprinting to the train station. Mi Jia had no choice but to follow, lest she get stranded forever. An attendant held the door open, nearly smashing Mi Jia's foot when, she, when he closed it. In two hours, they would be in Mukden, and there would be no going back. As they walked to the companions, they entered Manchuria. Mi Jia claimed the window seat, where they watched farms and factories pass by, idly wondering if they all had to work, have them work to work in them one day. Wind brushed her hair as a woman. Yong Im, if she remembered correctly, opened the window screen. She listened to the chatter of her groups as they discussed at what they would do when they arrived. She thought they would, she should participate. But they were singers, singers that had brooded themselves from all that they knew. Mi Jia hummed a new tune, taking her mind off of real life as she etched her lyrics in her head. Jap flavor point three nine point eight. Good lord. Okay, wow. Hmm. And trotting on the tote call. The black dish shines in the fluorescent light as a phonograph's neo cards its thousands valley. Through the speaker's soft music imported from Manchukuo, played, filling the room with sounds of women singing to classical music. Officer at Nakayama Sho sips his wine, skimming through incident reports. Setting his tea down, he takes out a fountain pen, signing off on the breakup of the Marxist ring. Dropping the file into the finished file, he opens a window, letting the cool breeze flow into the office. The doorknob sounds out, and Sho turns his head. A secretary sticks her head through the door. May I come in? She holds what seems to be a file, probably another report. As Sho's nodding, she promptly drops the file on her last clear spot on his desk. A tiny thud sounded out, and he sat down to look through it. Reading through the documents, his eyebrows raised. Truncated for brevity, in recent months, illegal music has exploded in popularity across Korea and the home isles. According to the related reports, the propagation of such music has been driven by the NAGUA, thus efforts must be focused to suppress the subversive media wherever possible. The memo must have passed around the, the damn place, Sho thought. Squinting his eyes as he looked at the record player, he thought to himself out loud, This is going to be a crap show. I just want to pay off the debt, man. Can I just get one more day? How many, how many, obviously, we're still going to get more events, which is fine, but trotting around the ocean. Choi Seung-gu Seung sat back in his chair, putting the next record into the player. As he did so, he spoke into the receiver in the Korean. You are listening to Radio Seoul, and I'm Choi Seung-gu. The time is 7 o'clock, and coming up is a song from Kim yong im He let the needle go as the upbeat flutes and the faint backing buckles gave way to the Queen of Trot herself. For someone who had lived her entire life under the Japanese rule, her Korean was nearly free of Japanese. Though he shouldn't really be complaining. He was born in America, after all. A knock on the door startled Seung-ju. His legs, his legs kicked the desk, shaking the equipment. Sorry about that, Seung-ju-si. Someone from the government came earlier and gave this to me. 
Su Yong held up a manila folder, stuffing with papers, continuing, I read everything, you will want this. She dropped it on Sengu's lap as he played the next song. Skimming over its contents, he smirked. This was something he could do. A week later, the PA system of the Japanese legations came to life. The songs of Toyo Nadeshiko and Mitsugi Nori played. Confusion and amusement turned to terror as all the military frequencies were flooded with music. Nothing could come in from the le legations, and nothing could come out. For Tokyo, this was a disaster. For Washington, Sengu, and Radio Seoul, the operation could not have been more of a success. Subverses everywhere. And... Nice, we're still doing very well. Very, 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 very well. Come on, just one more. One more. It's minus 17 billion. We gotta enjoy this while we got it, because I have a good feeling things are just gonna go BOOM! Hey! The Jewish Madagascar movement has won. Nice. God, I wish they get content soon. Aleutian Wilderness Resort. One of Sasakawa's associates more adventurous ventures is a Sakura Wild Wilderness Resort in the Aleutian Islands. Formerly a backwater in one of the most far-flung regions of the Japanese Empire, the Aleutian Islands have become sort of a mini-business haven for those who couldn't make it in Tokyo. Prior to the establishment of the Sakura Resort, the Aleutian Islands was a sea underbelly, ironic given its sparsity and distance from Japan. American and Canadian contraband goods flow through the tiny ports of Atu and Kiska. From the Lucky Strikes to the Playboy magazines, of course that was up until the IJN area commander was replaced after crossing some higher ups. Since then, since then the crime infested underbelly turned into a haven for J Japan's thrill seekers under the one of Sasakawa's many affiliates. From extreme hiking to snowboarding in the fisher water fishing or winter fishing in the frigid north of you know, many of the former criminals and contraband smugglers still eke out their livings here, just under a new shiny uniform in the veneer of an actual company. Sasakawa himself has managed to distance himself sufficiently from the project, though anyone who's anyone in Japan knows that there's more to the resort's profit than the salmon hunting or salmon hunting and tabloid friendly adrenaline rush adventures. In spite of it all, Sasakawa had to say clean no traces of the resort's profit is tangibly dirty money. Though one just has to ask for the special menu at the Izakaya in between between 2 a.m. and 5 a.m. every Wednesday, and one would discover that not much has changed since. A trip to the wilderness, perhaps. And I know this video is going on long. I, I have planned it that way. So, ooh, boom. Really cutting him down so we get the liberals to get a ton of support. Only 2% uh, support in the House of Peers and public approval. Only 16%, but that's okay. This is weird. Do we not have another event? Wow! I mean, I like, don't get me wrong, I love reading the events, but here we go. The Fall of Eno. In the wake of the... Oh, crap. Recent scandals following the uncovering of widespread corruption in government, an unprecedented political earthquake has shaken the very core of the Japanese Empire. Every newspaper in Japan and the entirety of the sphere is reporting that His Excellency the Prime Minister Ino Hiroya has been forced to resign following a vote of no confidence in the period die, and the news is rapidly spreading across the world as concerns rise about a possible shockwave of political instability spreading to all of Asia. The position of Ino itself as Prime Minister was a result of a tenuous compromise, resulting from an attempt to contain the influence of the Imperial Japanese Army and the civilian government by finding a mediation between the various wings of the Taisei Yoku Sankai. However, such a fragile solution has been shattered, and Japan's d delicate political equilibrium has been gravely upset. Few commentators dare make predictions about the future in such a volatile situation, but the gears of the Japanese political machine are already st turning, starting to, turning them to set themselves in motion direct to the crisis. Oh my goodness, my apologies. Politics is a harsh mistress. I'm not going to click on that until I can get my deficit down a little bit more. Come on, man. Give me just a little bit. Just a little bit. Just a s small, small debt decrease. Small debt. Come on. Oh, come on. I'm not clicking on that. we got still a week left. We can get more debt cut off before things just collapse. There we go. Whee! Hirohito, man, you're like an old dude. He was born in 1901. Well, if you want to read about him, go right ahead, but... Oh, that is really cool that he's actually here. No new focuses yet. But we shall see soon what happens. Oh, not bad, not bad if I do say so myself. A new Prime Minister. So, emergency meetings have already begun in the House of Peers and the House of Representatives to find a replacement for Eno. While Japanese politics are dominated by the Taisei Yoku Sankai, uh, the party itself is barely split among numeral, numerous rival cliques, each representing different interest groups with different visions for the future of the Empire and the Sphere. While the Emperor nominates a Prime Minister, the Diet has a massive influence over His Majesty's decision, as the Diet cannot always vote a candidate they don't like out of office. However, most commentators, both foreign and domestic, agree that a new PM will be chosen soon, as occurred when Tojo and Kido were forced to resign in the past. Two major candidates have sprung forth from the ranks of Taisei Yoku Sankai, Kaya Okinori, and Ikeda Manasoku. Mosuke. Kaya, formerly a minister of finance, belongs to the faction of the Yoku Sankai, termed reform bureaucrats, advocating for further centralization and state intervention in the Japanese economy while at the same time removing the last remnants of military influence from the government of Japan. The other candidate, Ikeda, comes from the conservative wing of the Yoku Sankai, the one of which former minister, Prime Minister Ino also belonged, a section of the party closer to the army and much less prone to reform. But regardless, we're going to end today's episode there because this is probably the longest, well, one of the longest videos I've ever done, and we shall choose our Prime Minister tomorrow. Regardless, I hope you enjoyed today's longish video. If you did, consider leaving a like, subscribe if you're new. Check out my Discord link in the description below, and I'll see you tomorrow when we choose our new 
Prime Minister, and hopefully eventually get to Mr. Takagi. Thanks for watching, have a great rest of your day.